overall yield of the device. So the, the takeaway from this slide, small caps. We are currently in small caps, and this is accomplished using the spread function on HGSI. So what's a, what are the different cap levels? Well, this, this will become important because we're going to create a filter here. Um, basically, I took this from, from Russell, uh, the Russell website, and this, these are generalized. It depends on who you talk to and what the big deal is. But in general, below 2 billion is considered a small cap, and above 10 billion is considered a large cap. You can see there's different segmentations there, mid caps, et cetera. The bottom line, uh, if you select stocks below 2 billion in market capitalization, uh, chances are you're going to be on the right side of the market. So how do we do this? Well, I'll leave this up here for a second to talk about it because as I, um, as I create it, you might not be able to see everything, but basically you have the ability within HGSI to create these filters. And the first line here says not equal to zero. So if market capitalization not equal to zero, then I don't want um, uh, to include those. Now some of the ETS in the database and there are other, some, some symbols in the database have a market cap of zero. It's not HGSI's problem, it's quote, quotes plus problem. We want to reject those. We don't want to consider those. And then we want um, all market caps below 2 billion. And just note here that this value, even though it says 2,000, this is considered market cap is given in millions, so hence why it says 2,000. That can mess you up. Um, there are other fields that we're going to see later that uh, you have to put in that don't have a implied thousands or, or millions signed by them. So let's go ahead and shell out and just take a look at you know, what this means. So when you click on filter, uh, you have the ability to, to create these things. And, and here's this small cap uh, filter capability. And if you don't have it, you can just say new filter. Um, since I do have it, here it is. Um, and bottom line is, is that you can change and put in anything in a filter. Now, I'm not going to spend today creating filters. That's a different lesson or a different time. But bottom line is that you can filter on small caps or large caps very, very easily with an HGSI. And in fact, I, I add to that, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit um, as we go forward here. So the, the takeaway from, from this is that you have the ability um, now to create a filter in, in HGSI and look at, at the small cap world. Uh, we've been in the, the small cap world more or less since September of 2010. Uh, we had a, a head fake in January, but uh, we, we've been in the small cap phase. Now you just saw it tick up just a little bit right here. Uh, it's very possible that we could be uh, uh, going over to the large caps. Your, you know, your crystal ball is as good as mine. I don't know what's going to happen on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, but for right now, uh, if I jump, if I get a signal to jump back into the market, um, I'm, I'm definitely going to be looking at the small caps. Okay, so we've established small caps. Step two, what's we want to get a general view of the markets, and, and I try to do this on a on a day over day basis. Um, what we have here is I look at the Dow, the Nasdaq, the S and P, and the Russell. When I say paying attention, I'm looking at MACD, I'm looking at uh, what are called slopes of the pricing uh, series, and I look at the 13 and the 34 day. It can be EMA or SMA, a uh, simple moving average. It, 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 again, the differences are subtle. Um, I'm looking to see that the price candles are above this thing I call ribbon of EMAs. And you can see that on the next screen here. And then I also look for this thing called bow ties. Um, rather than do it from this screen, I'm going to go ahead and just shell out again. and Let's just hop over uh, to, to do this. So to accomplish this, what I do is I, I go in and I just look at the major market indices. So I'll go into uh, reference groups, major market indices, and you can see that here are the major indices right here. And let's just, I don't care what we pick, let's go ahead and just pick the Dow Industrials. This, again, this view, I will make it available if, if people want to have it. Uh, is of my own creation. It's somewhat adapted from uh, Jeffrey's, what we used to call the 2AC uh, screen. It's basically a combination of, of uh, um, uh, what we call a bongo, what we call some of the elder indicators, and then I've thrown in uh, some of my own stuff to, uh, to come up with this view. This is the view that works for me. And, and one of the things that I, I can't stress enough is you need to, to figure out what works for you. Now, how do you do that? You use other people's screens until you, you start modifying them to, uh, to sit your, uh, fit your temperament. 
So what we've got here is we've got the Dow, and I'm looking back from, looks to be about November all the way out here to, uh, to yesterday's data, close of business data. What we see in the Dow, uh, we see in general, uh, we're, we're green on the bongo, which means it's, it's somewhat favorable on a weekly basis. Um, we do have a bit of a, a red uh, warning shot across the bow here. This line here is called the force index. The force index is the volume of the day multiplied by the day's price change. And then we smooth that uh, with a 13-day moving average, uh, which is the SMA method that you see here, and the one above it is the EMA. The two are calculation uh, have calculation differences, and hence why I plot them both, because you can see they respond differently. The EMA, the way to think about an exponential moving average, it's really simple. Uh, everyone is probably familiar with a conventional average, which is where you take 10 things, you add them up, and you divide by 10. Well, that's equal weighted. That's a simple moving average. So it gives equal weight to what happened 10 days ago as it does to what we're doing today. An exponential moving average weights what happened yesterday the highest. And so it basically discounts what happened 13 days ago or whatever the length of the EMA is. And why that's important here is that I am seeing the first breaking of the what I call the, the bull ice here. With this red that appears under the 13-day EMA force index, it gives us some indications that, um, that the, the Dow is under pressure. This next window here is the MACD window. And the MACD window, I've actually shortened this up a little bit uh, uh, than the standard MACD, um, just to be a little more responsive and, and to get out of the mainstream. But what you see here is you see the MACD line and the MACD um, uh, itself, uh, the signal line, crossing right here. We're losing momentum, folks. And this histogram is a measure of the, the uh, difference between these two lines. You can see it's almost ready to cross zero. So if we jumped into a Dow index today, say the diamonds or something, there's a very good probability that until this changes, uh, we're probably still going to continue south. So we're seeing pressure on the Dow. This next area here, I'm going to skip the Bollinger for right this second. This next area here, uh, this window, this is a slope window. And what I've done is I've taken a fast slope and a slow slope. Uh, Elder likes using a fast slope. I use the 13-day. He also likes using a slow so slope. The slope of a line, your eye can tell that this line right here is moving upwards. So this is actually the 140 or 160-day moving average of price. When this thing is pointing upwards, the slope is positive. When it is pointing downwards, uh, say in this particular area, the slope is negative, and hence why you see this zero here. A great time to have entered the Dow was when these were crossing from below and going positive. You can see that price series was going up. And you can see different phases. Although we're positive in the slope in this entire region right here, we're accelerating up. Now we're almost horizontal in this period. And now we're starting to curve down. We're losing momentum on this particular index in this case. Since we've crossed here, that's even more ominous. Now, we're still above zero, and you can see in the past, we've crossed above, and then we've resumed back up. And sure enough, the price has just continued an orderly march up. When do we get in trouble? It's when these things start crossing below this zero line. When they cross below the zero line, things get rough on our equity and our portfolios. And so what we need to do is just keep an eye on what's going on on the major indices. Again, part of the stock price is related to what is the major market doing. It's really hard to swim upstream. So watching this slope will give us an idea about momentum of the ticker equity that we're, we're looking at. And finally, on, you know, I, I spoke of this, this ribbon and in the, in the bars closing above or below the ribbon. Um, I plotted a number of EMAs here. Here's an 8, 13, 21, 34, 40. And I just walk them. You, you can see they're almost parallel. The price is walking right up them. It looks really, really nice. And when things start breaking down, you can see the candles start falling into the ribbons. They close below the ribbons, and et cetera. And this bow tie is when they come together, and then they expand again. And this, typically, this expansion point is usually a confirmation for us to move back into the market. So you can look at this ribbon and, and get a fairly good idea about the markets as, as a whole. So let me go ahead and get hop back into this. So we can look at, really quickly, we can look at different um, indices 
and get a pretty good view very, very quickly. We don't have to spend you know, 20 minutes per, per indice. And what I've done here is I've just captured the four that I said before. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. You can see that they're time correlated, so events that occurred in one pane, different dissimilar metrics, but you can see things were starting to break down and things started to improve here, and you can see now they're starting to break down. That's the Dow, the NASDAQ, same type of behaviors, the S&P 500, same type of behaviors, the Russell 2K actually has been breaking down a little bit longer. You can see the histogram here is negative. You can see we already have the faster uh, slope line already below zero. We've had a, a series of days. This is the fourth consecutive day and we're almost closing uh, in the candles below the ribbon. Very ominous for small caps right now. So you know, maybe we do hear the, uh, the hammer uh, nailing the small cap uh, universe uh, shut for a while. So the bottom line is that with the action of, of what occurred on the 12th yesterday, uh, each of the primary market indices is in the process of rolling over. I just went through the rationale of why that's happening. So given that, so what, what do we got here? We know that we want small caps, but we just saw the Russell 2K under incredible pressure and, and in fact leading the other indices south. So the question becomes, do we continue? Well, if you're time constrained, you could stop right here and you could say, wait and see. Um, that would make for a pretty boring presentation today. Um, what I would suggest, and I do this no matter what happens, is I start going through and finding stocks. I want to see market rotation. I want to understand sector rotation. And so from this point forward, um, we're, we're going to do that as if we were going to play the market uh, today and, and, and move in. So we're going to go through the process of how I look at individual stocks. Uh, of course, with an ominous cloud in the background saying that all the markets are, are rolling over. And at the end here, we're actually going to consider contra ETFs and take a look at a, a dashboard view that I have that'll uh, show us what we, we should be thinking in terms of uh, possibly going short or using contra ETF vehicles. So let me uh, show out here real quick and, and see, are there any questions? Um, Let's see, I would love to have the view okay. I will make the views. Um, uh, no, we can't do uh, itching charts in um, HGSI at the present time. Um, I will certainly will make the charts views and, and PowerPoints available. Okay. So is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming everybody is doing fine at this point since uh, nobody is, uh, is screaming and the moderators aren't screaming at me. So continue on from here. Uh, it looks like I only take longs. No, Robert, that is not true. Uh, I do play Contras, although I think right now, and uh, in fact you'll have to stay to the end of the presentation, lucky you, um, we will talk about Contra ETFs and um, um, you know what we can do there. Now in terms of shorting, this is not a shorting market right now. Um, I, I do short stocks, but I do not do you know, like two days shorts. If I'm going to short something, I'm going to short something where I'm, I'm going to hang on to it for, for um, a period of time. Uh, in terms of how to get the the uh, the Wilder RSI, okay, here we go. Oh, you got it, Mike. Okay, good. So let me go ahead and get back into presentation mode here. I cannot see your questions while I'm in presentation mode. All right. Um, the next thing that I do. Uh, is, is take a look and, and look at what sectors are being favored and HGSI makes this really easy for us. Uh, this, is, this is child's play really once you know how to do it. Um, bottom line is that I uh, take the, uh, the um, I just told my sound is very low, let me see if I can boost that up here a little bit. Everybody hear me just fine now? say questions if, if, if not. I think, uh, okay, there we go. I see lots of yeses there. Good. Okay. Um, what I do is I use the Wilder uh, RSI, which is a, a um, two, I set it for a two-week view, and we'll do that here in a second. The reason I do that, the default is using a, a Ian Slow uh, RS uh, approach, and I just have found through my own uh, 
testing that I prefer the Wilder RSI method of, of doing this. Now what we can do is go in here and I'm going to go ahead and go over to HGSI, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, I'm move some things around here on the screen. Bear with me here real quick, guys. Okay. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I like to do is go over here to sectors by stock and uh, go over here to uh, the ranking module. When, I am, when you do this, and again, um, I set the, you can set the Wilder RSI here and you can, you've got your options for what length. I set it back as a two-week RSI. Um, you, there's a lot of different options that you can do here. Um, you, when you click on the top of the particular line, you get to sort in that, uh, in that um, uh, asc descending uh, power or, or relative strength. And we can see that the top three here, healthcare, materials, and utilities, are the, uh, uh, are the strongest for, for uh, the, uh, the period yesterday. And so what we can do here is create watch lists from here. And, and this is where part of the power of HGSI comes in. One of the, the nice thing here uh, is that you can take any sector and, um, uh, or any industry group and you can change it over to the index group. When you do that, you get the stocks in the healthcare sector is essentially what I, I just did here. And um, let's see if I can move this up all the way. Okay, so what I've just done is I've now out of the 528 stocks that are available in the healthcare sector, I want to create a watch list out of these. And so the easiest way to do that, there's a function here, which is make group from list. And when you do that, you can put it into your, your group file. And uh, I do favorite sectors. I'm going to call this 11 April 12, and we'll just call it health, because I've already done these for the other ones. And instead of adding all of the stocks here, um, I happen to have looked down in the top quintile, the top 20% uh, of all 528 stocks is 107 stocks. So I'm going to have this thing pick the top 107 stocks and add them to a list. And what it just did is it created an index for that list and uh, now I'm, I'm in that particular list right now. We can do that for the materials group, I've already done it to save time and uh, we can do it for the utilities group. And again, all you do, uh, excuse me, is go back to um, the sectors by, oh, no, sectors by, not industry, excuse me, sectors by stock. You pick the top three, um, pick the one you want, and uh, you want to convert that to an index group and change it to stocks. And once you have the stocks, then you pick the top stocks in that particular list and in this particular case, um, see, I gotta move this around. Sorry about this, it's uh, covering my scroll bar. Uh, you can pick and you can see here the top 80, uh, excuse me, top 20% is up to 52. So then I would just create again, uh, make a group from the list, call it whatever you want and go from there. So I've already done this and the result is, that we now have three watch lists that have been created that we can now use and, and apply into our, our charts as we want to, uh, want to go forward. And what this has done for us, folks, is that this has created now a list that we know is currently in favor, right, healthcare materials and utilities, uh, and it gives us the strongest stocks in those, those particular sectors. Now, there's other ways to approach this, but this is the, the way that I like to do it. Now, one of the, what I would say, the, the more powerful things about HGSI is the ability to create endless numbers of watch lists. You can create more watch lists of stocks than you could probably comprehend and, and get through. And so having a method to down select is really, really important. Internal in the program, if you're not familiar with it, um, it, it which is really important, is that you have these things called smart groups, and within smart groups, uh, you have strategies, and here you have the Kilpatrick strategies, the Morales strategy uh, for pocket pivots, and then the Woodward and Brown, which has got just phenomenal entries uh, in there. So what this gives you the ability to do is create groups out of all of this. 
Uh, as I said earlier, I use IBD-50, I use my own stuff, uh, I also use Pascal Lane's uh, effective volume, and of course, your imagination. Whatever you want to screen on, you can make a list out of that and, and go from there. Um, when you bring them together, and I think this is a real crucial point that allows you to do some things with HDSI that I really haven't found with other packages, which is why, why I keep with the, the tool, one of the reasons I keep with the tool, is that it has this thing called a group inclusion report. It produces an HTML file which you can then see where different strategies have identified the same stock. Real important stuff. We're going to do this here. The output looks like this, and this is just one cell of, of that. So we have the, the stock name, uh, symbol name, the number of strategies that you selected that, that picked on this particular stock. And this is a great documentation thing. If you are interested in entering a stock, you can understand that all of these strategies have zeroed in, intersected this particular uh, ETF, or excuse me, this particular equity. That's really important for, for back testing. I typically shy away uh, from uh, intersections that have less than two um, strategies pointing to them, and that's simply because there's not a high degree of correlation from a lot of different areas. And so let's go ahead and do this. Uh, how, do, how do we go ahead and, and uh, uh, generate this? So up here in your main, main bar, um, you have tools, and then you have this thing called group inclusion report. This is, this is really cool. I like it. I use it quite often. And you have to select what stuff you want to include in here. And so this is purely subjective. This is how I do it. You can do however you want. I generally include the sectors, although we could disallow the ones that we, we said aren't in the top. It won't matter in the big picture here because you, you'll see why here shortly. So I, I choose the top 25 companies in each sector just because I want to see um, uh, what comes out of those. In Kirkpatrick, he you have to read a little bit about how he does what he does and how it's implemented here, but the bottom line is, is that we have lists. In the list, we have add, remove from your watch list, or add to your watch list. And so you just want the things that are added to your watch list. Don't select the ones that are being removed because they're being removed. Okay. Uh, Morales, of course, po pocket pivots are uh, important. Uh, you can make some good money there in understanding what, what those are. And then, of course, WMV, and, and we select all of those. Um, and I'm not going to select so let's uh, get rid of those, excuse me. And then down here, um, I haven't talked about it, but we have uh, EV candidates. These are effective volume candidates. I'm going to go ahead and throw those in there for now so we have it for later. And then we just ran this health favorite sector. I'm not going to select that because it's really duplicated right here, but here's health, materials, and utilities. Those are the three sectors that we know are doing really well. Look at the syntax, 11, April 12. We're going to see that in the report. And then the IBD, let's take a look and see what IBD 50 stocks uh, show up, etc. So when we do this, it's going to ask us now where do we want to stuff it. Um, I you know, put it in a location you can find it. Um, I, I suggest that you always put it in the same location. And away we go. Now, before you start looking at this, I'm going to close it, and I'm going to show you why. That was an HTM file, HTML file, and HTML files you can't do anything with unless you have an HTML editor, and most of us don't. So what I just did is I had preloaded this. Um, this is the report we just ran. Um, this is Excel, and in Excel, you have the ability to do filtering very, very easily. If you don't know how to do this, um, let me show you real quickly. This is, this is probably where this group inclusion report uh, can um, uh, really help you filter down uh, what you want to pick. Up here under the data tab, you have this thing called filter. And so if you hit, fil hit the column you want to filter on, you can see when I push down on the arrow here, it says select all. Well, I don't want to select all. I want just the stuff, but we're going to look for high column count numbers. So we did healthcare, materials, and utilities. And you can see that there are a number of stocks now with high counts. Now look at these. We've got some that with only two counts, and they go all the way down to one count. I typically ignore all of these that um, 
have one count, two count, three counts pushing it. I'm not really a big fan of three count. In fact, I'll just take it out of there. Two is my inside limit. And what we have left is out of all those stocks, and, and there were a large number of them, we've now down selected it to you know 10 stocks or so. And you can see that two of them were intersected by many, many different strategies. If you expand this, you, you'll get to see those, but there's no need to because you already know that they were in your group that you were looking for to begin with. Note here, there's no utilities. Um, that's kind of interesting. So the utilities were not intersected by the other strategies, the uh, healthcare and materials were. So we have this, this list, and now from that list, we can, we can go forth and prosper. Now, here's a problem. The problem in general is you can't select in Excel. I haven't figured out a way to do it. You see what happens. Uh, you can't select and paste. It's because these are all part of MERB cells. This is an HTML file. Now, I'm sure somebody out there who's listening knows how to do this. Uh, contact me offline because I always have to bang these out uh, inside of a notepad, and then I have to save that notepad. A location and I save it to the same place all the time so I know where to go get it. This is the list that we have there and incidentally it is the list that we have um, we are going to import right now. So let's go ahead I'm going to add a group now of that list of ETF or list of uh, equities and I'm going to call this 11 April 12 and let's just call it uh, H GSI final, just so that we know these are the stocks for today, and load list, and there it is, HGSI final, and there are the, the stocks that are imported. It's going to ask to make a index, say yes, and there's the index, and now we have the ability to take a look at these in detail in HGSI. Now, it's a pretty thin list. Normally, this list is much longer. It's a pretty thin list because we've been... Uh, dealing with uh, uh, you know, the markets, which I've been pulling back. The first thing to, that catches my eye on this list is, is that this is the index, right? This is comprised of all the stocks in that basket, right? And what we see is we see just an astronomical MACD rolling off here, right? The strength has just been, been phenomenal. Um, some key points here, the, the bongo is favorable, so of you know, for the list uh, generated on this date, uh, it's been under uh, increasing uh, support and, and uh, increasing favoritism. Um, the one thing that I like to do is look at this, uh, this numeric value chart here, and I can see that when you put the cursor wherever the numbers change, I'm going to put it on yesterday's data, the last known data, and we see that both bull and bear power are very, very positive. That is very bullish for this basket of stocks. Uh, the elder 13-day moving averages, uh, both green, which means they're positive, and the elder two-day is red. Now, that doesn't mean it's below zero. I actually invert this line because in the elder methodology, you want to buy after a reset. A reset is when the elder force index goes negative and then comes positive, so the transition from green to red, it would be the day that you would buy it when you actually are clearing prices. So right now, this is saying that, you know, by strict elder rules, you would not have entered any this index if you could trade this particular index. One thing that I do now is we have the index, and I just clicked on uh, the ranking module, and now you have the ability in strength order, relative strength order. Remember, I'm using the RSI um, two-week RSI. Wilder RSI, you can go on down through these and take a look at them. Well, here's intuitive. Intuitive looks pretty darn good. Look at this. We've got a new breakout that's occurring in terms of the elder. We've got the force index, which pulled back uh, a little bit uh, yesterday. And if today was up, it would actually be signaling that you could you could move into this uh, this equity. I haven't checked it. We can check it in a little bit. Um, the MACD histogram here. You can see that the signal line and the MACD are, are positive, really trending, and that the histogram itself is positive. Looks like it's losing a little bit of momentum, but nothing to get worried about. You can see that, you know, in general, uh, we've played in this particular area before, and the price has done pretty well. 
Uh, the Bollinger, this is kind of interesting. We've actually transitioned out of an, uh, what I would consider an overbought area, and we're, we're coming down into the value zone. Anytime this is yellow, I, I tend to perk up here and say, okay, this, this could be a good opportunity for entry. What we have here, uh, again, is my, my slope analysis. Note, first of all, it's above zero. That's, that's the most important thing, right? They're above zero. They crossed. Note, they crossed before Elder went positive. Uh, note what, where the histogram was. This is a very good indicator to get an idea that a stock's going to move upward. You can see it already peaked, right? This is momentum peaking. This doesn't mean that it's dying. And, of course, you see that here in the price. You actually see the price dipping down. Hence, it would make sense that although it's positive, it's, it's slowing. Again, not to worry. This is a pretty good candidate. So we take a look at the, the price ribbons. We close below. Now we're expanding back up. And the fact that the price ribbons are all expanding and looking pretty parallel here is a really good sign. This is, you know, uh, other things being constant. I mean, we haven't looked at effective volume for ISRG. Um, this is a pretty good candidate. OK, Richmond Mines. Again, um, we can go through this, but you get the idea. Um, we're greens up here. We pulled back a little, looks like pretty severely, but it held the eight day is my green line right here. Uh, volume uh, was up. Obviously, it's been up over the past few days. Bottom line, above zero, good MACD, um, yellow value zone for Bollinger. Not bad. Not a bad candidate. And again, we scroll through this one. This is impacts uh, IPXL. Uh, same type of situation set up. Good bongo. Uh, just taking off. I mean, this thing's just marching right up. It looks like it's losing a little bit of momentum. You can see that in the histogram. Good value. Still above zero by a fair amount, um, et cetera. I think you guys get the idea of what, what we're looking at here. And as we go down that list, remember, there are going to be a few that, that aren't going to work. This, this is actually one that uh, would cause me some concern, even though Bongo has been green as far back as we, we were looking here. And we've got a new breakout, as indicated by Elder's uh, Force Index. And we're in the value zone. Look what's happening with momentum here. Okay, This, this is a key that I, I want to alert you to. I typically will not enter a stock when we see the fast slope cross below or cross from above the slower slope. And that's because you don't know where this thing's going to stop. I like to see this kind of pattern where it comes, it, it bottoms out, and then uh, we, we move up. These are um, uh, EMAs on these. These are not simple moving averages. Um, I prefer the most recent action because we're dealing with a 34-day on this bottom one. Uh, on the slower one, I prefer that the, the most recent behavior is, is what we want to wait upon. Uh, not everybody shares that. In fact, I think uh, uh, Elder uh, uses simple moving averages for a lot of his work. So it's it's really subjective. It's really, really subjective. So bottom line, um, uh, CPHD, probably not an entry candidate, although it's got great setups here, guys. Look at this. I mean, this the, this pattern here, uh, if it, it consolidates a little and then comes back, um, you, you you're in great shape. It's well above the 160 day. It's well above its other moving averages. It seems to have been trading a little hot here. It's now pulling back to the eight day. Uh, it went down and touched the 13 day, but it closed on the eight day in a doji. So you know there's something that you can you can you can play with there. Jazz uh, Jazz has been good to me in the past. Uh, uh, it looks like it can continue to be good. <clears throat> Let me scoot this window out of the way. You can see way back here in November, this thing has just been you know, almost parallel lines here on the bottom. It's been performing well as an industry group. Look at that 160 day, the slope on that 160 day. It's almost a flat line. This thing's just been marching upward. But this thing's a volatile stock. When you don't see consistency in the slopes, you see uh, bounce you know, up and then bounce on the line and then up again, bounce. But note, it never goes below zero. At least the fast doesn't. The, or the slow doesn't. The fast did touch down here a little bit. We pulled back right in the early February time frame, but then we just resumed our upward march. And it's really important that 
you understand that it's okay to have a positive slope. That's a good thing. It's okay to actually cross below, but you don't know what the right side of that looks like. So wait until this faster slope turns up. Once that faster slope turns up, you then know momentum is coming back into the stock. And you can look back and see where that methodology of stepping into that would have benefited you. And conversely, if you would have gotten in at a high point like right here at the, uh, the beginning of March, even though you're positive on your slopes, you're now losing momentum and you would have been somewhat frustrated that you would have gotten in, say, right about here, and the price would have done nothing until, oh, I don't know, right about there, 21st, 22nd, which is when we know that we, we started taking off. So, you know, pretty good, again, a pretty good view of, of what's going on. This, um, this concerns me, uh, Perigo, in that we're out of the value zone. We're back into the light pink here and almost, you know, this could be going into the red. I love this part here, though. Look at this. This is the MACD. It's just pushing upward. We're pushing new highs in terms of the relative strength of the MACD. Uh, we've got green bongo. We've got these, uh, uh, the, the bull in the, excuse me, the bull. Um, power and the bear power are both positive. Again, you can see that by going to the um, uh, numeric value. It's 4.8 and 3.35. Anytime these are positive together, the bull power, in case you're not familiar, is the high minus the 13-day moving average. So you want that to obviously, if you're trending up, that'll be a positive number. Bear power is the low minus the 13, or the 13-day minus the low. So when you do that, if the low is well above the 13 day, then you're going to have obviously a positive number. And this is just screaming bullishness at us right now. This whole uh, behavior with the bull bear power, with the MACD, with the uh, elder force index. Note it has it not given us an opportunity to get back into it. And that's a shame. Uh, if you're a strict elder follower, you would have just shrugged and said, well, that's the way it is. There are ways, you know, that you could obviously play to get into this thing. There was a pullback day here, so any time it pulls back to the low of the previous day and then moves up uh, intraday, that's called a V pattern. Uh, I know a lot of my colleagues like that type of pattern, and then that would have allowed you to participate uh, intraday. But of course, you got to be at your at your terminal or have an automated tro uh, program to uh, to accomplish that. Bottom line: Look at this green green volume yesterday. We really marching up. We're a bit overextended. I don't have the high jump uh, view on this one, uh, but we're a bit overextended over the eight days, so probably not worthwhile to jump in, especially with Bollinger screaming pink at us, but definitely something to, to watch at. Um, let's see, what do we got here? We only got a couple more. MASI, um, we're starting to roll over up here. Doesn't mean we're going to. We're starting to trend down here. We're still a good distance on the positive side, uh, two days back. Uh, we'll see if the eight-day holds. You can see it held for this, uh, these two periods right here. The eight-day uh, held on the lows really, really well. Real important to see that it holds on uh, today and that it continues moving up. So your, your risk is pretty well defined uh, as you move forward there. Uh, QCore, um, again, just, just moved up. We have this big gap up. I'm scared of gap ups where they don't come back and actually touch the support, uh, let alone fill the gap. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But note, we've got the red here. This thing's taken off like a banshee, though. I mean, this thing is just rocketing upward. So um, you're on your own on this one. I personally wouldn't get into it until it came back a little, until the Elder 2 day gave me an opportunity to come back into it, and until the Bollinger actually pulled back onto a yellow zone and, and uh, you know, gave me an opportunity to enter. Um, Westlake, we're actually going to use an example here coming up. Um, Westlake has given us a warning sign right here. That this is the Elder Force Index, the EMA method, showing us that we've got some weakness now on uh, volume times the change in price. We're back in the value zone, but look at the histogram on the MACD. We're crossing over from above. That's bearish. Uh, we're almost zero, or we are zero. Let's look here. Uh, MACD histogram is negative. It's negative zero uh, point something. So uh, the fact is that we've, we're losing momentum in, in West Lake and, and probably shouldn't get into this thing. Uh, we've got two days down. It looks like it's holding at its eight days. So we might be on the fence with this. You'll see in... Uh, subsequent analysis that we're going to do using effective volume, um, what the outcome of this uh, this particular stock is. I just do it as an example. Okay, 
So enough of uh, the, the screens here. I think that's, uh, what do we got? Oh, this is the last one, so we might as well clear it out. So here's, um, again, here's the bongo. It's green. We've got the good setups. Look at this. We've got an opportunity to pull back. It pulled back to the 13-day, although after going below the 21-day uh, on its tail, and it did close yesterday uh, above that. That's a heck of a move down, but no huge move in price volume below the average volume. That's interesting. That is not a nail the coffin shut on this particular uh, equity, so uh, not necessarily uh, uh, ruling it out. And this is, this is gold, so it's, uh, it's interesting here. What values do I use on the MACD? Um, this particular one, let's take a look. I think this is the adjusted one. Um, edit. Uh, 8, 11, 25. So instead of the 9, 12, 26, I've shortened them by one day. Um, and I don't know where I got that. I think uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Xin Yen actually uh, does um, does the 8, 11, 25, and it does appear to give us a little bit of a head start, but again, it's subtle. It's not going to make a big difference in the overall use of, of the MACD. MACD is a confirming indicator. You cannot necessarily use it for uh, uh, trading by itself. Okay, Elder does uh, 8, 11, 25. Thank you, Cliff. I do appreciate that. All right, so uh, let's take a look at where we're at here. Uh, time check, we are about an hour, or about 55 into this. Okay, good. Um, uh, Paul, there's a few questions out there. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got, uh, uh, do I see a bullish divergence in the Dow MACD histogram? Um, let's go take a real quick look. We can do that. Did I have that chart going? Charting. Just go over here and go indices, go Dow. And let's see. Well, for the Dow, um, the question is, is, do I see a bullish divergence in the Dow? Um, no. I personally do not see a bullish divergence in the MACD. Um, I see a number of warning signs in the MACD, actually, that can continue. Um, this, this loss of momentum here is worrisome, and the crossing of the fast over the slow slopes is something that uh, bears watching, especially being this close to the zero line. Once we get to the zero line and go below it, uh, the, um, I think the Russell is an example of that. Yes, here. Uh, here's the Russell, and you can see that the fast has actually uh, dropped below the zero line. So on a 13-day scale, uh, time scale, the Russell is losing value day over day on a 13-day scale. And it has been now doing that for two days. It crossed over yesterday, and this is, uh, or two days ago, and then yesterday is the second day. So what that is telling you in general is that the markets, uh, you know, this is breaking down faster. The question was specifically about the, the Dow, um, uh, Dow Jones, uh, the utilities, and no, I do not see the divergence. It doesn't mean that it's not there, but my eye is not picking up on it. And given the weakness that I'm seeing in the other indices, uh, with the Dow being um, um, the uh, you know, leading industrials, large caps, um, I'm not seeing uh, any reason to go into this. Now, that being said, uh, look at the volume down here. Volume isn't screaming sell. And you remember our other chart that we had, um, there is a uh, argument to be made, I think, that if I go down to this thing, uh, that large cap versus small cap, I've got the Dow up now. I do not have, um, let me go ahead and zoom out here. Uh, if we use the Dow with the Russell and the, the, the uh, IWM and IWB, uh, uh, um, that chart that I showed you, the uh, let me zoom in here a little bit. The chart that I showed you earlier was cut off here because it was done two days ago. It's taking me a while to put this presentation together. Now we've crossed above that uh, that moving average, and even more importantly, the slope of that moving average is almost horizontal. So we may be favoring large caps. Is that a case to go into the Dow? Not yet. Um, I, I'm I'm, I'm loath to say that uh, we should be playing the market on the long side right now. And, and there's some other indicators to, to show us that here in a little bit. So let me go back to where we were. 
Does that, uh, does that answer your question there, Cliff? Okay, how do I input EV stocks into HGSI? I'm a follower of EV also. Okay, well, we're going to cover that in a little bit. Um, we're going to do that if, uh, if time allows. If time doesn't allow, I, uh, I don't have anything. I don't have a hard stop today, so I can stay on if uh, Debbie doesn't uh, kick us off here. Um, you're supposed to laugh, Debbie. I didn't hear you laugh. Okay. I still didn't hear her laugh, so that's not good. Okay, so the next thing that I want to call into and just uh, start tackling here is we've got the group inclusion report. Remember, it's this intersection, uh, that concept that allows us to filter down all of these stocks. And you saw we, we have some good stocks out there. And if the market turns up, I mean, today was obviously a, a better day than, than yesterday, but I'm looking right now at Finviz out of the corner of my eye, and the markets have been bleeding since about 11 a.m., so it's, it's you know, uh, today's not a day to get into the markets. Um, what I typically do then is what we just went through. I look through each of the individual window panes. Uh, I call up the... Um, the numeric window, so if there's any question about some of the things you can't see, uh, what what uh, you know, what is the behavior of the overall chart? Uh, this is uh, of Westlake Chemical, and I call it the eye chart here because I know you can't see it very uh, very cleanly on yours. You will in the uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, also in the PowerPoint, then obviously you'll have why I think Westlake uh, is positive on some regards and. Uh, negative on other regards, and we just went through that in, in fairly good detail, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. Um, one thing that I do want to want to say here is that of all the indicators that that I use, uh, the slope indicator is by in large great for timing your entry. It's not so good at timing your exits, but you're, for timing your entries, uh, it's it's really important to understand. You want the slope to be pointing upwards. Uh, and the more conservative you want it to be positive and pointing upwards. You may miss a little bit of the play, but then you don't get as many whipsaws. So you need the slopes to point upward or at least stabilize horizontally to enter. Uh, and if you're unsure of this, then you should always check whether effective volume is supportive of a move into the security. So that being said, uh, I'm going to take a, a two-second break and get some to drink here. Okay, where in the chart list is the 13-day and the 34-day? Well, we can go do that here real quick before I get into effective volume. Um, go up into charting, and when you add uh, into a particular window, I'm just going to go ahead and edit, um, you have the ability here to create moving average slope. And so if I hit edit, you can see um, it's, it, it's one of your, you know, if you add indicators, moving average slope right here. So moving averages, moving average slope. Uh, so you, once you select that, that moving average slope, um, you have the ability, let me go back into that, uh, you have the ability to uh, um, then change it however you want. Simple, I think is the default, exponential or weighted. I use exponential. And you can see that I've got the period set to three. And then it actually ap applies a smoothing factor of four. So it's taking four periods of, a thir of the 13-day MA, right, and then it's applying that out. Some people use five. Some people lengthen that. Some people, I don't know anyone who uses this value, the slope periods, shorter than three. Um, three is a good number. Four, I think, is better. So I hope that helps you, Ralph. Okay, so let's get back uh, to where we were. Okay, so th the, the thing here is... If you're not sure about a stock, there is a tool out there. It's not part of HGSI, but it's something that I think you need to be aware of and I think can uh, help improve your understanding of what's going on in the market. I know it has uh, significantly changed my behavior for the positive uh, in terms of, of the uh, of my performance as well as how I look at, at the market. Now, let me... I know there's a lot on this slide, but let me just tell you what, what's on the slide so you don't have to read it necessarily. A gentleman uh, by the name of Pascal Willain uh, in the website is listed. 
uh, has created a methodology. He has a book. I suggest you go get the book. I have the Kindle version as well as the, uh, the written version. Um, he's created a methodology to look at uh, the minute-by-minute minute volume uh, associated with price changes and be able to categorize those as uh, what is called large effective volume, i.e. institutional volume, and small effective volume. Why that's important, this is very different than, say, an up-down accumulator or other, other thing because it distinguishes between the size of the price move and the volume in that particular minute. And it, it's pretty remarkable what this can tell you about a stock. And we're going we're to focus a little bit of time on this. My suggestion is that you do not apply it, the concept. There are a couple websites out there, and I'll introduce those to you here shortly, uh, that allow you to key in any stock and, and get what the effective volume chart looks like. Well, that only works in, in, in good sense if, if you have good volume on the stock, good dollar volume on the stock. And hence, I use this $10 million share, $10 million share or larger as kind of my inner threshold. Sometimes less works, other times it fails miserably. So this is what I have found experimentally to be kind of the inside. This, uh, this concept of money flow um, is, uh, is really, really important and Pascal is making uh, some pretty significant inroads on, on how we, we can use this going forward. Um, again, taking the Westlake stock that we, we had here earlier that was in our chart, I just decided, well, let's go take a look at it in terms of effective volume. And this is, this is a telling picture. If you remember back on this chart, on the, the Westlake chart, we saw some weakness here in the EMA. We saw good bongo. We've got you know, the, the histogram collapsing over, but uh, we're in the value zone for Bollinger. We're still very positive here in terms of the slopes, but we are crossing from above. We've only had two days down. It's a doji that held on the eight. Volume was up over average on uh, yesterday, you know that that you could argue, and you got more pros over here than you got cons. That you know it's not a bad stock. Look at this. Now this should open your eyes to just what if, if HGSI is opening your eyes to be able to find stocks. This should open your eyes at what the behavior, the the institutional behavior of, with that specific stock is. Um, what you've got here in green is this LEV. This is the large effective volume. This is the large player volume. And then you've got you and I, or at least me, uh, as the small player um, here in red. Very interesting behavior going on in the stock. Here's the share price. So here we've got starting a gradual sell-off right around 329, whatever the case, three, so the end of March, we're starting to see some distribution as pricing stabilizes, but has been in generally in an uptrend. You can see that people move back into the market right around 4.7, we, we spike upward, and then look what happens here. We, we just completely collapse in selling of, of the um, of the shares, but look what the retail guy is doing. He's still in while the big guys are stepping out. And sure enough, look at the timeline. I know you may not be able to see it very accurately on your, your particular screens, but the timeline, these guys, the large guys started stepping out. The prices were still going up slightly and then they collapsed. So the retail guys were getting taken to the, the woodshed in this particular case. The fact that the LEV started to exit prior to the small EV shows you that this stock has lost institutional support. So I could care less what's happening here on this screen. This is the death nail for, this, for me entering this stock any time in the short, short term. Now we may see a bounce and we may see it turn, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, Westlake Chemical is, is uh, a hands-off stock. So the question then becomes, how do we, you know, how do, we go do this? How do we, we find these stocks? So Pascal has a site. This is the easiest way that I know and gives you other benefits. I'm not going to parade Pascal stuff here. That's not our purpose today. But I want to show you that it's pretty darned easy to, uh, uh, 
to look at individual stocks. So WLK was one of our stocks, and there it is. And you can see he, he gives us some information about how the stock is behaving and what it's been doing. In fact, he, um, um, you can see the behavior a little bit better here of what, what's been happening. The bottom line is, is that you have the ability now to, to look at effective volume, key in your stocks, and see what is the overall behavior of, uh, of that particular stock. Now, not all stocks in the HGS site are listed in, in, uh, in Pascal's world. Pascal has about 1,000 stocks. He doesn't have the universe of, of quotes plus at his disposal, uh, nor does he want to have the universe of, because a lot of this is still uh, in, in um, scaling stage. Another chart or another site that you can use, which I think has a lot of pros and cons, is this uh, Monest site. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you this is www.monest.net. Uh, slant charts. Um, just it's in Dutch, I think. I, I haven't looked at it here recently. Um, bottom line, you have the ability to go over here and select effective volume, the small, large, all-player graph. And so let's look at um, the um, at WLK in that same vein. So here's WLK. You can see that sell-off. Right, here's uh, the small players are the blue line here, the large players are the red line here, and sure enough, um, we see a sell-off, uh, even though the price hasn't, uh, hasn't necessarily reflected. We've lost a lot of institutional support. This, this site, the Moness site, has the ability to plot any stock. And remember my warning that I said earlier about this comment right here. Um, this comment, you need to make sure that the dollar volume of the stock you're evaluating is significant over 10 million. Uh, the green line, sorry about that, the green line is what is called total. It is the arithmetic sum of the small and the large. And typically, you want to see TEV, totally effective volume, moving upward showing that there's, there's uh, attraction within the, the overall stock. The fact that it went down dramatically shows that the large people stepped up far greater amounts than what could be made up by the positive influence of the, uh, uh, the small effective players. Okay. So again, Monest is one way to do this. Uh, Monest doesn't, is just charting. Monest doesn't give you much else than that, and it's not accurate if there's low volume and you can get yourself wrapped around the axle. What I do, uh, I use TradeStation, and TradeStation gives you the ability to go in and look at a given chart. Uh, in terms of effective volume, I, I have the plug-in from uh, Pascal's site. Um, what was it, WLK? We'll go ahead and put that in here. And you can see, in the sense of, of uh, Westlake, sure enough, where this red line here is the small guy, the blue line here is the um, uh, large effective volume, and the yellow line is the sum, the arithmetic sum between those two. This is on a very short timeline. I also have the ability to, uh, um, to do this across a, uh, a longer timeline, and I think the results are a little more market. You can see that Westlake has been actually in distribution for some time. I say that because the large is below the retail. So the, the raw values uh, have been, been uh, pushed out. In fact, as I scroll back in time here, I don't ever see the large guys really dominating this over the last 40 days. That's important. Uh, that tells me that this stock has not had a lot of institutional support. Um, over time. Yes, this is TradeStation, and TradeStation does uh, the plug-in requires one-minute bars in order to function. So this is intraday. Uh, this is why I like it, because I get to see relative behavior, and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this here in the, in the next couple of slides. Okay, so um, what, I, what I do is that once we have found suitable candidates in HGSI, I check the effective volume on each of them. Um, and as I said, uh, not all of them are going to be at, at um, uh, Pascal's site. 
despite that, I have either Pascal or I have uh, TradeStation, depends on what PC I'm on uh, at the time and if I'm on the road or not. If I'm on the road, I use Pascal's site. Um, the Moness site has a large majority of stocks. Uh, charting of EV is relatively easy. You just saw that the presentation is different and you have to be very, very careful. Again, if you don't pay attention to that dollar volume thing, um, you, you could get yourself wrapped around the axle and have the wrong, uh, wrong conclusions about what you're seeing. So there was a question earlier about how do we, um, uh, yes, Gertrude, and Gertrude just said that uh, um, Pascal will add any stock that you want. Uh, he has always done it for any stock that I've requested, so that's a good thing. If, if you have a burning need, he'll add it, and it'll be in the next day's run. Thank you. Um, and so the um, question that came up earlier was how do you bring effective volume into it? So let's step back here a second real quick. What have we done here today? We've, we've, from a top view, we've decided that small caps have been in favor, but there is some pressure with the large caps right now. Right there, We saw that spike up. We saw also in the charts that we were doing that we had three sectors that were favored, but the intersects of those sectors only said that healthcare and materials were going to give us good candidate stocks. We then brought those into HGSI. We look at those in HGSI through a number of filters, um, uh, Bongo, uh, MACD, Elder, uh, slope analysis, this ribbon analysis. So we've got a pretty good view. We've got a good, what we think is a good basket of stocks. And then before we make our buy decision, we go over and we, we, we manually pump those into, uh, uh, into the EV site and just get an idea on what institutional support and what's the, then the overall behavior. Pascal flips this a little bit on us. Uh, Pascal also provides us the capability of having another watch list added to our, our world. And so Pascal generates the EV status on his universe. And so what he essentially does is he over here, and, and if you're a subscriber, you have access to this. Here's the link to the general list of stocks and their ratings. And he also gives you, by the way, stocks with the best ratings and then conditions on those. You know, terminology I'm not going to get into today. The the bottom line is, is that you now have another watch list that you can pull in. Um, let me just pull this in. You have another watch list that you can pull in. This is for today, sorted by sector. And he gives you all sorts of criteria that, again, is not necessarily what we're interested in today. What we can do, though, in, and again, just like what I did earlier, we want to look at these, these stocks. Um, knowing a little bit about what we know. We, we know the um, sectors that are being favored, and we also know, in general, um, uh, the uh, small cap, large cap thing. We can now look into uh, a list of stocks using the uh, EV component, the effective volume component, and basically using this filter capability, I can throw out stocks that aren't um, uh, being bought right now. Now, being bought in Pascal's world means that large effective volume is increasing. So I want to get rid of the stocks that are being sold. And when we do that, we've just got buying continues, buying surges. And then this thing called AB, I'm not, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but AB is called an active boundary. And it recognizes that stocks move between a higher level and a lower level. You can imagine that if a stock has been beaten into the ground and you buy it just after it's been beaten into the ground, if it historically has performed well, you have an expectation that you're going to make some money over some period in time compared to the guy who is buying at the historic top where you, your upside potential isn't necessarily as great. Active boundary is a metric that addresses that. When it's 100, you're buying near the bottom of a historic cycle. And when it's near the top, you're buying where it says zero, you're buying at the, the um, uh, relative peak of, of that particular equity. So we can, um, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Let me go ahead and do this a little differently. Uh, we can go in here and, sorry for this, guys. One more time. I love it when uh, stuff works. Um, 
we can go in and filter on specific stocks. And as I said, we want to get rid of the things that are being sold. I'll just get rid of the blanks for now, all of it that's neutral. And this AB, we can set a condition on that also. Uh, again, this is going to be video recorded, so you'll be able to go in and, and see how to do this. And I'm just going to select AB above 80. So what we've done now is we've selected stocks that are um, have near the bottom of their historic range are being bought. Whoops, what happened there? Sorry for that, guys. Uh, are being bought. We can see the list is coming down here. And we could even, if we wanted to, we could go in and just pick the sectors that we know are performing well. In the, in the uh, mantra of time, I won't do that. And I'll show you how you import this into uh, HGSI. I just selected this top column here, this, the, this column after we've, we've done our filtering, and I control c it. And I'm gonna, just going to put it into a uh, new notepad, and I'm going to save it. So I'm going to say um, 11 April 12 uh, EV uh, demo, and hit text. Okay, so now it's in there. I'm just going to go ahead and minimize this. Now let's go back to uh, HGSI. And in HGSI, we just want to add it to, to one of our groups. Easiest way to do that, uh, let's just go ahead and add. I clicked on the folder I want to put it into. And what I'm going to do now is add group. And I'm just going to say uh, 11 April 12 EV demo, DEMO, and load list. It came up because it remembers where you were last and 46 securities were brought in and sure enough here we are we're, we're in, in in the overall group now uh, I say okay and generate an index and here's the overall uh, behavior of this particular index you can see elders favorable remember these are going to be relatively new emerging technologies so or new emerging newly emerging excuse me um, equities. So the bongo is not necessarily going to be supportive because these are all now starting to emerge. Uh, they've been beaten down, hence why the bongo is low in, in overall price and now are starting to, uh, to, to move up as a group. You can see though that they're, they're under pressure. So even the stocks that are coming up out of the EV world are showing us that they've got some pressure and they're actually going to be very, very close to crossing zero. Look at the MACD again crossing. We've got pressure on the 13-day force index. The, uh, the ribbons here look pretty good in general, but we're starting to cross into the ribbons again. Um, this is a, a fairly bullish, uh, or excuse me, bearish uh, setup. So bottom line, even though we could pick stocks from, from Pascal's world, it doesn't necessarily mean that these are good stocks to pick right now, and that leads me to the next part of this. And, and so the, the key here that I think you have to understand is this concept of money flow. And Pascal spends a lot of time on this, and this is, is a great concept. He's basically looking at large effective volume and total effective volume for different areas, for different sectors, and, and then he, he compiles that. And, and we are presently in a short signal period. It just signaled two days ago uh, on the 11th. Why is this important? When you're in a short period, you don't buy stocks long. Well, guys, what did we find way back here when we were doing, uh, let me go back to this stuff. What did we find when we were doing the Russells and, and the S&Ps? We're rolling over. This is just another confirmation using a completely different methodology, by the way. Um, let me get back to this. Uh, a completely different methodology that allows us to understand that institutional money is flowing out of the market right now. And unless we see institutional money coming back in, it doesn't make any sense to come back into the markets on the long side. We said that back at step three, if you recall. That was an hour and ten minutes ago. But going through this process of generating the list and understanding, I think, is, is something that we all need to do and, and that will be very, very advantageous over the longer haul. This is a zoomed in view of money flow. This is the same picture that you see here uh, with the S&P and then this, he's got an overbought, oversold indicator. This is just the, the money flow in the S&P. And you can see we had a, a, a go long signal 
a cache signal. These are happening fairly quickly, by the way. This normally, the span doesn't occur this frequently. Uh, it drops down. Uh, we had a, as soon as we crossed below the zero line, we had a confirmed cell, and then that kept us out of trouble going into the mid-March. Coming out of March, not shown on this diagram, we actually had a signal that caused us to go long. Uh, there is an overbought, oversold indicator, and we were very oversold, and when that transitions out of the oversold region, that will kick us back into the long side um, uh, on a uh, tentative basis, and we climb back up, and you can see we got a good signal here last week, and then bam, we're, we're back on the short side this week. So bottom line, you should not be moving into the market on the long side right now. You should be protecting profits or cutting your losses. Um, that, that's all I need to really say about that. So given that, Given that, we know that um, large cap versus small cap, we know what sectors are being favored. We've gone through the stock analysis. We, we have the tool now to compare what the institutionals are doing. And the big picture money flow says the indices are falling apart, the, the wheels are coming off the, the cart, and it is confirmed by a completely independent method, uh, effective volume, which says that institutional money is flowing out of the sectors that leads us to think, well, we should be going on to the short side. Well, maybe, maybe not. I think there's a great thing to do with an HGSI that I rely on. I've posted about it in my blog lots of times, and I urge you to, to uh, uh, do this yourself. Basically, what I do, and then let me just go over to the blog instead of doing this, uh, or on, not the blog, the uh, HGSI, rather than trying to... Uh, nail this uh, um, in PowerPoint. Um, I have created a, another watch list <laughs> called Direction Bears. These are the Direction Contra ETFs. They're leveraged to 3x. So if the S&P 500 moves up 1%, the Contra in the S&P will actually go down 3%. So very sensitive to overall moves in general. When you do that, and here are all of the ETFs that fit into that category, when you do that with my, my view here, you see some pretty interesting things. Now the question was, shouldn't we be thinking about the Contras? Um, yeah, we should. We should be thinking about the Contras. Here's why. But does that mean we move into the Contras? You have the MACD of course, Elder is going to fail because Elder is not in a positive uptrend in terms of price change and volume, right? So you know Elder is going to fail. We are really early in, in a turning point in the market. You can see where it turned here back in March, but then it immediately, as soon as this bull took over, it, it went back into, uh, into cash. You can see the EMA, which reacts faster, started moving up as of yesterday's action. Look at the histogram here. The histogram just went positive as of yesterday. Now this is as of the, the these are the, the, uh, the Direxion uh, ETFs. So these are real sensitive. And you can see you get a bullish crossing in the lower half of the MACD window. This is like being handed to us on a, on a platter. Um, this is a beautiful place to be because what it basically says is that there are some ETFs. Remember, this is the index of all of these, right? This is the average of all of these things. There are some ETFs which are, are worth considering on the contra side. Look at this. We have another crossing. Now, it's still below zero, but it's pointing upward, and they're pointing upward at a pretty good clip. As soon as these things go positive, the 13-day will be first. That's the red one here. That means that on a 13-day scale, this baby's starting to make money. All right, so the entry point is actually within the next couple days if the bear continues. I don't know what the right-hand side of the, the graph looks like. Right? I don't know what it looks like out here tomorrow and next week. But right now, this is saying get your shopping list ready. Look at the prices of the index. They're marching upward steadily. They're starting to cross into the ribbons. As soon as they start clearing the ribbons like they did back here, of course, they've got a hold. 
in March they didn't hold. They didn't hold back in uh, early February. The, as soon as they start clearing and holding, you know you've got the all-in signal. Now you can do some, some surgical strikes. That's not investing. You can do some trading. How do you do that? How do we figure out right now which ones are the best? Well, you built the index, click on ranking. Here you go. Here's the relative strength. So EDZ, let's go look at it. EDZ, still negative, it's almost crossing. Looks like it wants to go positive on, on uh, Elder, but it's still got a day. Look, we're well below the value zone, right? I mean, this is, this is screaming buy, but I wouldn't do a full position on it, right? You, you got you to gotta wait till these things really start maturing. But this would be one that is a pretty good candidate. Let's look at the next one. Ah, this one's already above zero. This one is... Oh, the 30-year treasury, <laughs> no wonder. It's been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So 30-year treasury, um, uh, when, when life is not going well, it, it looks to be, uh, the contra treasury, I should say, uh, looks to be like a good place to be. And that makes sense overall, right? Interest rates go up. People who have locked in on bonds, the value goes down. So then the bear would increase in value. Um, it's interesting to see what happened here. I don't know what the news is that promulgated this yesterday, but overall, uh, the trend is up. We're, we're, we're coming down. Take a look at, uh, uh, at TMV. Look at the semiconductor bear here. Starting to come up. This is a really tight pattern in this ribbon. Um, we're just starting to cross over now uh, into positive territory on the, uh, the slopes. Look at this. We're gonna start moving from green to yellow, so there's some accumulation. We got a confirmation in both the EMA and the SMA methods uh, in terms of elder. We've got a positive, uh, um, um, excuse me, uh, bull power. And look at Bongo. It's starting to move up. So the contra um, semiconductor bears are starting to to show some life and and uh, could be a good way to go if the market continues lower. You get the idea of what we're doing here. I mean, it's you can see we're still early, we're still below zero, but we're pointing up, we're crossing over. Here's something that's gone positive. This is the small cap. Makes sense, right? We saw the Russell 2K get hammered early. Look at the corresponding 3x of the Russell looking positive now in the MACD. This could be, a, you could do a good trial balloon to come into this and look at this, the 13-day uh, um, slope has just crossed into positive territory. So, so from this day forward, uh, you'll be making money if the trend continues. I don't know what the right-hand side looks like. Uh, nobody else does. All right, so let's, uh, let's wrap up here. Um, let me go back down to the big picture here. So, so what, what's the big picture? The big picture in terms of scanning, I use HGSI to generate these watch lists. Um, once I get the candidates, I use effective volume. You see how I do that. Um, you can also go to effective volume if you are a member and you can download uh, a list of good EV stocks and then pull them into HGSI. And when you put it all together, I think you need EV to make your final pull the trigger decisions because it tells you if you're swimming upstream against the, the, uh, the institutionals or you're swimming with them. Remember, follow the whale type of mentality there. So um, what I do is I use HGSI and TradeStation. Once you have your list uh, in HGSI, and, and you know what you're going to do, you have the ability to then go in and uh, pick the stocks for, for subsequent analysis. And as you saw earlier, we had this, this list of, of what is, you know, we called the final. One of the neat things that you have the ability to do is copy this list to the clipboard. And if you do it as a text column, all these symbols now are sitting in your, your, uh, your system and you now have the ability to go in to your package, and I just happen to have TradeStation here, and if I wanted to um, look at the effective volume on those particular ones, index doesn't apply, obviously. We said ISRG in, in, in uh, Intuitive Surgical was one of the stocks worthy of consideration. Right? It's down on the day, but let's take a look at effective volume. Uh, again, small is red, 
large as blue. Look at what we've got here. Uh, we, although we have a general degradation of, of large, it's not huge. Right over here, it's a little over 200. Down here, it's 134. The units aren't important. They can be explained, but it's not important for what we're trying to do here. Bottom line of what we're seeing here is that Intuitive, on a 40-day basis, looks pretty pretty good. Okay, it's it's not bad. Um, if we look at the same graph on an eight-day basis, you can see that Intuitive actually has been losing some support over the last two days, uh, institutional support. So is this a candidate to get into? Um, perhaps not. Um, and, and so what I do is I would just blow it off my list like that, and then I just keep on scrolling on down until I find you know, a, a series of candidate stocks that, that look pretty, you know, pretty compelling, pretty good. Um, I think in the slideshow, yeah, let's do this, I think here, uh, I actually show, you know, what, what is something that's looking good. FAZ is the 3X Direxian ETF on financials. It's the contra. So as the markets, as the financial markets go down, this thing goes up three times, or three times as fast. You can see that the EV has been going up, up, and up. The big guys are stepping in, and they're playing this. Uh, and they're making money day over day, right? And you can see that the price of this, e of this ETF has been going up. The retail guy, you and me, or at least me, as I said earlier, um, isn't doing diddly with this ETF. And we're not making any money with it, but the big guys are. This should be a candidate on your list for making money in a surgical trading. You don't invest in this stuff. This is trading. These are surgical strikes. And so EV... With TradeStation, this real-time capability can help you understand. Look at the gap down that occurred this morning. This is this chart's from today. Gap down occurred this morning. EV went up. The big boy stepped in the minute this thing went south. That's really important. You know? You've got a step down in price. Look at EV. It remains constant. This can help your decisions on, am I losing institutional support on, on a given, given stock? So this particular one is SQNM. Let's just go over there so I don't have to, you don't have an eye chart. SQNM. This was another one that came up. Um, this is, again, the EV pattern on SQNM. Look at what's happening here. You have price decreasing from the upper left all the way to today, but what is EV doing, or large EV? Large EV is increasing. The big boys are stepping in as price goes down. That is an incredi incredibly bullish pattern, independent of what the market's doing. This is telling us that people like this stock at this value. So um, this, is, this can be fairly important. Ah, thank you, Robert. I, uh, I caught that now. <laughs> um, so the you know the, the the big picture here is that you have the ability now with these lists to be able to paste them in um, excuse me paste them into TradeStation uh, look at the EV in real time you can get the EV plugin from Pascal's site it works wonderfully it does does all sorts of, of things for you and it gives you a pretty good view of of you know the what I would say is the um, is the big picture as we go forward here so. In, in wrap-up, I know I'm five minutes over here, but in wrap-up, um, the markets are rolling over, and we've confirmed this in many different ways. Uh, there are stocks that are appealing to large institutions, and, and you can see that through the EV presentation. And it's just a matter of going through. I'm not suggesting that you have to have TradeStation. You can use Monest. You can use uh, the Effective Volume site. Uh, I happen to like TradeStation. Uh, we are early for a broad entry into Contra, but if the decline continues, you have numerous suggestions and indicators that you're moving in the right direction for contra ETFs and things related to that. So conversely, if we dip and then close above the prior resistance, uh, HGSI provides us a good way to generate lists of solid candidates, and then you can filter using EV uh, to follow the whales. So I think that is it. And it is. And, Debbie, and Paul, I apologize for being no, six minutes over. <laughs> no, you, outstanding job. But I wanted to point out that we have one question by Jeff Williams on percentage B. And Robert Brees just had a comment. Yes, I saw Robert's comment. Okay. 
Um, as far as the percent B, yes, uh, good observation. Thank you for following along. It is reversed, and the reason I reverse it um, is because I, I'm a color guy. I'm a visual guy. I, I, I hate text if I don't have to look at it. And green means good, and red means not good. And to me, I don't want to enter a stock when it's over when it's percent B is in the the highest of ranges. So I've inverted these colors, and it doesn't mean you have to. It just uh, it's like the Elder Two Day. All right, the Elder Two Day normally green is when it's positive. I make green negative to alert me that this could potentially be a candidate for entry. Um, if uh, you know if it closes above the high of the previous day, so anything else? We are just getting a lot of um, kudos for your for your work, a lot of thank yous, and a lot of excellent presentation. And um, again, this will be posted at the website, both the powerpoints and the, the video. That's all on my end, Paul. Do you have anything more you want to add? No, I just want to thank everybody for their time. I I know you know doing this during the day is uh, uh, is a bit challenging, um, in in general, uh, for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, I, I appreciate your time, and I'm happy that uh, um, that you could make it. We have I'm showing 75 people online right now. I don't know what we got up to, but uh, um, thank you for your time. We got folks. up uh, to. I was going to say we got up to almost 90. <laughs> That's right. a record for us. Oh, <laughs> very good. All right. Well, I think uh, what we will do is uh, um, I'll send you the um, uh, PowerPoints, and you can upload that with the recording, and uh, and we'll be there. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll be in touch about our May webinar. Very good. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Bye bye.